we're going to be in Judges chapter 12. But before, but before we start Judges chapter 12, I wanted to show you what this was right up here. And uh, if you remember, if you had remembered last week, I said that the battle, and I was talking about the uh, what had happened in that battle, and uh, uh, where this is what the scholars have put down. I, and this is also what they teach at Bible College. They teach you it's almost direct. Jephthah came from Tob, which is all the way up. They met at Mizpah, and then they start to fight. Okay? They were at Mizpah, and, he, and it shows him coming down. I'm telling you, that's, there's no way that it, it happened like that. And I'll show you why. Look at verse, in chapter 11, look at verse 33. Now, you got to go with what the verse says. Okay, in 33, it says, and he smote them uh, from uh, Arrowair. Okay, he, oh, excuse me, verse 32, it starts. And Jephthah did what? What's the first thing he did? He passed over to the children of who? So he went into their territory, right? Right, Miss Mary? Okay, now look at their territory. Their territory's there. First thing he does from Mizpah is he passes over. Do you notice that? That's This is not passing over. He passes over there. First thing he did was pass over. How can you pass over? He went up this Jabok. See the Jabok River? Yeah. He went the Jabok River. Now watch. Follow the valley. That's, that's a valley in between those, all those ridge lines coming down, and it ends right here. Now look what it says in the next verse. He went from where? He smote them from Arrowware. All the way down to Minith. Even 20 cities. This is how easy this is. If you pass over to the children of Ammon right there and come all the way around, you end up at there. Do you know you capture all those cities just by the fact of cutting off their retreat and everything else? Mm -hmm. You've already gained them. And that's what he's saying there. They, 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 they got all those cities. The 20 cities. Why? They had surrounded it. This is, a, this is a great military move right here. This is actually the kind of move the South used to get into Gettysburg. If they would have been smart, the South would have disengaged, redeployed, went South, got between the North, the Union Army, and uh, Washington, D.C., somewhere in the area of Chambersburg. They would have destroyed the North because the North would have had to have came after them, fought them to get to save Washington, D.C., and the South would have won. But you've got to understand something. They don't tell you this in your history books. The South, the South never had the money. They didn't have the production. They were the, the moment the war started, the clock was ticking. They couldn't win anyway. Just so you know, World War II, the, the, just, just so you know, the Germans couldn't really win. Once the Germany doesn't have a doesn't have an outlet for the sea, they, you can't, you couldn't win uh, if it goes long. But don't worry about this stuff. That's their stuff. But that was what they said. But they went around this way and see how they come right in. And then they, the, it says from Arrowell to Minute. Now do you see how, we, how, how much... The worst thing you can do is start fighting first and then try and push. Why not sir, go through and get as less contact as possible, losing the least amount of people, and then uh, look how easy it is from here to here. You see? That, that's a momentum, that, that's a better play. And that's what it says. They passed over and then went around. See, what we did in this room is by using the scripture, we can correct the scholars. You know? I think the map's backwards. It's a mirror image. It probably is. Masada's missing. Yeah. Why would Masada be? It's ought to be right at the tip of the Dead Sea. Oh, that's over there. Oh, over here. Now, <laughs> on Jordan's side. Uh-huh. Yeah, but that would be on the left there. side of the Dead Sea. Yeah, but that's over there. We're, gonna, we're, we're looking at the, this is the right side. Remember, we're in Gilead. Gilead is on the right. This is the first, this is the first time they're on the right. Uh, this is the... They they have moved over to the right side to the uh, east, to the east side of Jordan right now. 
Nebo, anybody know Nebo? That's where Moses went up and saw the land from here. So we're right in that area right there, and there's Heshbon. And, but uh, that's what I wanted to show you the last week. I just didn't have a map or anything, but that's what I was looking at when I was bringing that up. Does that help anybody out looking at something like that? I mean, I, I, you know, I'm not, I don't know everything about the military and stuff, but I've, I've deployed division and stuff, so I know kind of how maneuvers are. Uh, and I've been to uh, all the big schools, and that's not a big deal. Well, it just makes sense. Yeah. So let's get into chapter 12. We've got 15 verses to get through. Uh, we're probably going to be, uh, usually I say, I'll say 15 verses. We'll get through easy. Now nah, we're going to be here the whole time. Don't worry. So uh, let's, let's uh, look into this. He had already just won. Uh, remember there his daughter had come out. And he made a vow that any, whatever passed through the gates, he was going to uh, give to the Lord and sacrifice. Whatever came out, his daughter came out. And, um, and he, she, he gave her two months, 60 days basically, to bewail her virginity, walk up and down the mountains or, or, or whatever. Now, i got to say this about, that, uh, about the girl. I know Jephthah should have figured out, hey, man, I made a bad vow. He should have begged to the Lord for two months. Maybe the Lord would have requited. I guarantee you, the Lord would have requited that uh, because it wasn't a wasn't a vow he should have made like that. But he was lacking the Word of God. Uh, he he was more like uh, more like a guy who wants to serve God but without God's book. There's a lot of them out there. People uh, they like to use the Bible. They don't want to learn the Bible. That's most of your Bible colleges. They use the Bible. They don't. Uh, read the Bible. Now, I'm not talking about Bob went in 76, probably a whole different ball game in 76, but nowadays, uh, if you meet Bible college guys, they tell them, oh, you can, you, you'll learn the Bible once you're a pastor or once you're a missionary. Uh, right now, we're concentrating on church building. Uh, what that does is puts the church over the God of the, of, of, the, of the Bible, the God of the church, and you can see today, I'll give you for instance, people, we lost the election, right? We got met, but we, it's cheated and all that stuff. Uh, let me ask you something. I, I, I was on, I was on uh, listening to uh, some preachers. I, I was hearing them converse and everything. I saw some of the things they were putting on. Here's what I will tell you. I didn't hear one time one preacher say, we need to repent. Yeah, yeah. You know what they're all doing? Like, oh, we've got to get the Christian law. So, shut up. It's God's church. Why would you call, the, why would you call a lawyer? It's God's church. Who cares what the world's doing? To tell you the truth, if you haven't figured it out yet, we're going away. Yeah. God's right. removing his hands from it. Right. Okay? The church is dirty. God's church right now is dirty. And that's a like it or not thing. It's just the way things are going to happen. It, it's gone down. The church doesn't even. The, I'm talking about God's own church right now is not respecting their own, their own, their own Lord. They brought stupid things into churches. They got idols in the churches. Uh, they they're playing music that's carnal, rock and roll, everything else, and even the songs that are in the King James churches. They need to throw those things out. They're a disgrace. Get back to the hymns and get back to the old paths. Yeah. Get them. Get rid of these altars and all this other junk and and begging, be, begging wood and everything else and having uh, puppy dog preaching and everything. Get rid of it all. Get back to the book. Get back to learning the book and the word of God. That's what's going to change people. Not some flamboyant preacher who thinks he's good. Amen. And can get up here and yell and every. I, it doesn't. It's the book. This is the only thing in the universe you got. This is what needs to be put out. Amen? This is how God talks to you. And the one other. There's no other way. Prayer in this. Amen? So, uh, but I, I, this is what I got about that girl. She gets two months. You ever hear somebody say, what if you had, what if you had two months to live? What would you do? Well, I'd be going here. I'd be going there. I'd be doing this. Yeah, uh, okay, just kill them there. They, why, why, why let them go 60 more days of sinning? 
Do you realize how people think? They're so carnal. I, told, I, I bring up these things. Uh, you know, if a guy went down to the hospital uh, and he f cured everybody in the hospital, well, by the time he left the hospital, people think he's, a, he's, he's some great church leader. He hasn't led one, people to, one person to Christ. What good is it? Forget the body. It's going away anyway. Get into the soul, man. That's what God cares about. He's lifting his hands away from all that stuff. You know, I, I, uh, he's, 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 he's a, God's a spirit. What do you think he wants to heal? His spirit. Amen? That's what you have to understand and get a, get a, just get a good look at that, okay? Um, but this girl, you know what she does? She gets ready to meet God. For two months, she bewails the thing and gets ready to meet God. What if I told you you got two years left? What are you going to do? Why did you get right with God? Why don't you get as close as you can now? So when he, when you, when he does show up and when you do meet him, you're right on line. Amen. That's exactly right. Amen. Get your, there's some good advice. Because your trips, why would God heal somebody? Think about this. Why would God do all this healing uh, everybody, we get in the prayer session, you know what everybody asks? Heal this person, heal that person, heal this person, heal this person. And I'm, I'm, I'm sitting there going, are they saved? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know. Well, why would he heal? So they can go back to living a carnal life and sinning more and more and more? You think, oh, I can see God, yeah, I'll heal that one and that one and that one. They heal them, what do they do? They, next thing you know, they're at a, a poker game, that, that, you know, two weeks later. <coughs> Why would God want to do, want that? You gotta understand something. You know when somebody says, "Hey, you need to talk to my brothers and the five brothers." You know they need to get, they need to get saved. And, and what did God say to them? Yeah. One raised from the dead, it wouldn't help. They got Moses the prophet. It's what he's trying to tell you. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. It's the word of God that changes, not the dead man. Coming up. But yet there was a dead man that came up from the grave and, and, and he can save and they're still not listening to him and he's God. Amen. Maybe we need to start praying for people to get closer to the Lord. Yes. Which I can guarantee, I can tell you people, I've, I've done prayer lists for years. I never hear anybody ask for that. My wife and I are begging every day for our, for our children and our grandchildren to know the Lord, to get closer to the Lord, to drop the junk and get close to the Lord, to know the Lord, to hear his voice. What's important, that is. I care less if they had the materials and all that other stuff or cold or whatever. You know, most of the time they get sick or something like that. Maybe, maybe you're praying about a situation the Lord wants them in. You know, it, if they're saved, they're his kids. You know, uh, he knows what he's doing. You get what I'm saying? Just something to think about. All right. All right. You owe me twice. <laughs> Amen. All right, let's go to, uh, to chapter 12 now. And he says, and, and the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and went northward and said unto Jephthah, Wherefore passest thou over to fight against uh, the children of Ammon? And didst not call us to go with thee. We will burn thy house upon thee with fire. And Jephthah said unto them, I and my people were at great strife with the children of Ammon. And when I called you, ye delivered me not out of their hands. And when I saw that ye delivered me not, I, I put my life in my hands and passed over against the children of Ammon, and the Lord delivered them into my hand. Wherefore are ye come up unto me this day to fight against me? What, what, are, you, what are you coming up here to fight against me, he's asking. He gave them, you know, there's one thing you got to understand about Jephthah. He's an in-your-face guy. He's a guy that turns around and says, okay, uh, when somebody brings something, he doesn't wait to tell them in Facebook or on some message thing or write them a letter. You know what he does? He gets right up there. Let's talk about this. You want to talk? Let's do it right now, face-to-face, -face, right here. And, uh, and he's an in-your-face guy. You know, do you realize that most people don't like people like that? 
But you know that's how God wants us to be. I don't say you have to be, I don't know how Jephthah delivered the message. He's kind of like a warlord, so I can see he's kind of tough. Uh, I can tell by his character on how he handled his daughter's situation and how he handled many situations. So I can say he's a pretty rough guy. Pretty rough guy. So, um, so Jephthah here, he, uh, he, he meets with these guys. And, and you have to understand, it's hard to stand before envy. And Ephraim has an ability to be envious right here. Okay? Uh, they've done this before. Uh, let's go back to Judges chapter 8 real fast. And if you remember, after, they, after Gideon had fought with the Midianites, look at verse number 1. And the men of Ephraim said unto him, Why hast thou served us thus, that thou callest us not? And then went to fight with the Midianites. And they did chide with him sharply. And he said unto them, What have I done now in comparison of you? Uh, is not the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim better than the vintage of Abiazer? God hath delivered into your hands the princes of Midian, Oreb and Zeb. And what was I able to do in comparison of you? Then their anger was abated toward him when he had said that. You know what the difference between both of these guys is? is that Gideon actually is a nicer guy. <laughs> Jephthah's like uh, calling him out. Uh, he's putting him on the spot where uh, Gideon was like, well, let's compromise this and let's, he's more diplomatic. Jephthah's not diplomatic. You know, you have one guy, look, I, I got to tell you something. One guy, may, one guy that's a soldier, one that's more of a soldier, soldiers aren't diplomats. That's one of the things they didn't understand about George Patton. He wasn't a diplomat. When they asked George Patton, what do you want to do next? He said, let's kick the Russians out. What? That's what generals do. We're not, they're not here to please the newspapers. They're here to fight. Okay? I can't stand when a general, they turn around, they say, the general said this, and the general said that, and he's, a, he's, he's doing this, he's a discriminator. Shut up, man, he's a general. He's supposed to be a guy that's a fighting wars. Okay, you, if you're a guy, I want a guy, if a guy's going to fight wars, I don't need, I don't need a classroom dude. Think about that. We don't need classroom dudes to fight wars. You know what we need? We need guys with some oomph. Let me tell you something. This was, if what happened yesterday and happened two years ago and happens in all these elections since, the, since those days, if that would have happened in like the, before 1950, real men would have stormed the Capitol and took it over. But we have guys today don't even know what they are. That's how bad it's gotten. Well, you know, a little baby, I wanted, I'm glad my God, my dad called me a boy. My whole life, I used to get mad at it. Can't, he, can't you call me by, he never called me by my name. Now I'm like, yeah, I'm glad he did. Why? Because I know what I am. At least these, I know what I am. These guys don't even know what they are today. He didn't call you Sue. No, he did that. Okay. <laughs> he did call me that. Oh, he did? Yeah, he used to say, boy named Sue, he used to take that Johnny Cash thing, made me mad, anybody called me that was going to get hurt. <laughs> Back then. <laughs> Amen. All right, so we see they, this is an ongoing thing with them. It's happened before. Uh, it, you know what that reminds me of? I don't know if you remember uh, in your history books. In World War II, uh, we fought two sides, okay? We fought the Germans and also the Japanese, right? right. The Axis powers. We, th we had two theaters of operation, okay? Well, no one picks up on this, that Russia was dealing with Germany and fighting Germany. Now, Right at the end, when they got done with Germany, you know what they did? They declared war on Japan and got and, and before Japan uh, was able to surrender. I mean, to tell you the truth, Japan was pretty much uh, to their own island. They were uh, besieged, basically, and had nowhere to move. And we, they were trying to see if they would invade. So it was smart for Russia to get involved. And then they asked Douglas MacArthur for the northern islands in the uh, Sea of Japan that were owned by Japan... And MacArthur's response was that um, if, uh, if he, uh, the general there, if he had went into uh, that, if he lands one troop in that island, uh, he was going to kick him all the way back to Russia and, and kick them all the way back somewhere else. And you know what the general said? I do believe you would. Today, look at what's happening. 
They're taking Taiwan, taking this, and we're just sitting there going, ah. why? We got Gumby in charge. But that's what they did at the end of the war. What are they? They're, the Soviet Union at that time is acting just like Ephraim. We want a peace. We didn't fight, but we want a peace. That's how that is. And they got an envious, they have envy. So what do they do? They make a threat. Look at the end of that verse 1. We will burn thine house upon thee with fire? What a great statement to make. This guy just has, a, he has an army out there. They're still on the field. They st just won and took over 20 cities. And you're going to tell the guy who's the general of that army, we'll burn your house down with you in it. Hey, that's great. <laughs> you know what you just did? This is not Gideon. This is Jephthah. You know what, Je Jephthah's an in-your-face guy. What do you think is going to happen? He's not going to put up with it. And you have to understand, he doesn't have a president over top of him and a Congress and an everything else to tell him not to. He's got the Lord. It's a different situation, man. And i got to tell you something. When the Lord's on somebody's side and you know it, you, you best not play that game. Amen? That's why I tell people, stop kicking around the church. Stop hurting churches. They're doing it out there, splitting them, beating them up and everything. You don't realize what, what who, you're, who you're messing with. Look, Saul, Saul was a bad man. But David didn't go in there and, and beat the whole, take over the place by force. You know what David did? He stepped back. The reason why? It's his, still Israel. He's still the Lord's anointed. Uh, with the fell, uh, David had, had slept with Ahithophel's uh, granddaughter, Bathsheba. Ahithophel was David's counselor. He went over to Absalom. Okay? Do you know what the Lord said? Ahithophel, you've done wrong, basically. He knew Ahithophel did wrong. You say, what do you mean? He had a real beef with David. Yeah, but your personal beef has nothing to do with Israel. What's that tell you? Your personal battles have nothing to do with this church. I've watched too many people walk out that door trying to beat the place up, and the next thing you know, I just see them going bitter, 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 and they just go down and down and down. It's not a good sign for anyone, people. God's been working on this church, on his church for 2,000 years. And you don't realize, remember in Ephesians, when he says you love your wife, all these other stuff, and very, what did it say at the end? But I speak of Christ and the church. He says, you, you want to play with my church? Uh, Proverbs chapter 6 at the very end, you know what it says? He won't give you, every, there's no ransom. You can't give him enough gifts. Watch out. Watch out. Not a good thing, people. That's just good advice for you. You know? So he gives them a threat. What's that? We, we'll burn down your house. <laughs> okay. And, and Jephthah said unto them, I and my people were in great strife. You know, we, we, were, we were fighting this battle with the children of Ammon. I called you, so you lied right there. I called you. You were a no-show, is what he said. You wouldn't deliver me out of my out of their hands. You wouldn't even show up. And when I saw that, that you delivered me not, what do you do? I, I I took all the risk. I I put I put my life in my hands. I took the risk. And what did I do? I passed over to the children of Ammon. And the Lord, who does he give credit to? The Lord Lord. Amen. He says the Lord delivered them into mine hand. Wherefore. Then what, what are you coming out here this day? Why do you want to fight against me about this? Go, really, what he's, really what, he's, what he's telling them is what? Go fight who? Go fight the Lord. I've been praying to him. He's the one that told me. I'm the one that, he's the one that, I, I'm the one that just did what he said. You want to have a battle? Go fight him. You ever notice that, that, that that's, that's the way it should be? Okay, you want, you want to kick against the church? Go kick against the church. Kick against the Lord. You know what it is? Well, that church ain't this and that church. Who made you the judge? <coughs> you have no judgment over God's church. How do you know it's God's church? It's got this book in it. Yeah. If it has a different book, it ain't God's church. Like it or not. 
It's either this book or it's not. God will not work on anything else. Amen. And uh, let's go on. He says, verse number four, Then what happens? Uh, Jephthah, he gathered together the men of Gilead, and he fought, fought with Ephraim. And the men of Gilead smote Ephraim. You want to fight? Okay, we'll fight. Because why? Because they said, you Gileadites are what? You're fugitives of Ephraim. You're a bunch of half-breeds of the two. Uh, the Ephraimites and the Manassites. Manassites. Or, that's what he's saying. You're just half-breeds between both, those two brothers. And you're the in-betweens. And verse 5, and, and the Gileadites took the passages of Jordan before the Ephraimites, and it was so that when those Ephraimites, which were escaped, said, let me go over, that the men of Gilead said, um, art thou an Ephraimite? Okay? And, and, and if they said, nay, we'll go on from there. But first is this. You know what they did? Uh, when they, the, they took the passages, okay, and, and look how it says it, of, of Jordan. So you got the Jordan River, okay? And what they're doing is they're taking Fords away. Everybody knows what a Ford is? A Ford is a, it's not a 150. He's right, it's a cross. It's not a truck uh, or a car. A Ford is actually to go across where you can cross a river. Okay, that's what he's talking about. And um, they take away all the Fords away, all the crossings is what he's saying. Uh, what they are called, they're called pickets. They're setting out pickets, okay? And they're setting them out, and they are what we call warning signs. They've been using those uh, for hundreds of years, thousands of years in battle. Uh, that When you, you get the army, and the army's moving, and it sits down for the night, you set out pickets. What are they? They're to be guards and rear security of, of whatever. You've got to have them because you don't want to be nobody to sneak up on you. Amen? Today we use uh, MPs and rear security. That's Just so you know, we really don't use the MPs because uh, our new army does not know how to use the military police today. They have them on gate guards instead of doing rear security and, con and, and combat convoy security on the road. That's who does that. When you want to move supplies... The MPs are the ones that do it. The MPs are the ones that do rear securities. They're not supposed to be cops. Amen. And that's what happens. They, they, use them as, they use them all the time in everything they don't need them to do. They're not gate guards. Gate guards are, are to be pickets. They're the people who are from the units that need to be doing a lot of those things. Amen? No, you don't really. Well, whatever. <laughs> so they got the pickets and they, they, they're not allowing the fords, they're not allowing them any fords to cross. Okay, so what happens is they say, they ask them, are you a Ephraimite? They're down there at the ford. Are you an Ephraimite? Verse 6, then said they unto him, uh, say Sibboleth. And he said Sibboleth. And, and, he, and he said he said, uh, now, he said, say Shibboleth. They said, Sibboleth, for he could not, now watch how it says it. He could not frame to pronounce it right. Okay. Has anybody noticed that when, um, when they call languages, what do they call them in the Bible? Tongues. And uh, what tongues are, the reason why they call languages tongues, and what makes the difference is that the tongue is where language comes from. It's the movement of the tongue. The tongue has no bones. It has a different muscle. But the tongue has a weird way of moving. And that weird way of moving makes different sounds. Now, it's e the reason why it's like easy for a child to learn languages, different languages when they're young, is because they haven't, got, they haven't gotten the uh, they, one way of the tongue. See, you're used to your tongue being in an English way of speaking, so your tongue moves in that way. Now, if uh, we turn around and take you up to Massachusetts, uh, they speak a little different, okay? They don't say the word, like when you say, we say the word car, they say car, yeah. you know, or something like that. Now, me, I'm from Philadelphia, everybody knows that, so you say, I don't even know what you guys say, but when it comes to that liquid H2O, you guys say it wrong, it's called water. It's not water, it's water. Water. 
How do we know? Well, I've been saying it for years. You guys are the wrong ones. But can you understand? You know where I'm from when I say things like that. My wife thinks it's funny because I talk to the dogs in Philadelphia and they know it. I go out the door and I go, Jeet! And they run in. Why? Because it means, did you eat? <laughs> or do you want to eat? Jeet! Okay? That's the word. We say that's a Philadelphia word, okay? I know you got your New York Northern word. Sometimes I'm listening to somebody. And now I don't have a problem. When I first came up here, they were I would go into stores or something. Some lady would talk, and there would be like a few words. I'd be like, what's he doing say? And uh, or they'd ask me. Uh, they I'd say they I'd say, could I have a glass of water? What's that? They wouldn't know what water. I'd say, give me. Can I have a glass of water? They don't know what that is. I was okay, whatever. And I, and I would I would I, water. And I've been all over the country, and, I, and I'm not changing, just so you know. <laughs> you guys got to change for me. We understand. Amen. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm immature. <laughs> but anyway, he, uh, it's the tongue that is the effect of it. That's what makes your, you speak different languages. So here we have this one side, they can't say it. So when they, he says, say shibboleth, they couldn't do the shish. In fact, they, they went zzz. Sibboleth. Sibboleth. They couldn't say shit. The S and the H they can't do, so they go sibboleth. Like how in Massachusetts they could say the, the ca. Cob or something like a cob. Uh, well, there, uh, he probably listened to the video, but there's Len Cassidy. I don't know if you ever met Len Cassidy. He, he, preached, for, he preached for me up in Raw Sea. And uh, Len is from New Hampshire, and sometimes I don't even know what that man say. Or Maine. Maine's bad. <laughs> yeah. Maine, all those guys up there, Maine, Massachusetts, yeah. all of them, uh, they speak different language. And if I I gotta tell you, I was down now I was down south too, and I was down in um I was down at Fort Benning and one day uh one day I had to go out and meet a guy who was doing targeting. I wanted to get all the targets up. So they had signed me and some other guys to him. So I was, you know, they, we were out there setting up the targets on the range and some guy came up and he he said, uh, he looked at me, and he turned around, he said, he starts talking, he says, now you've got to get those targets are over there, they're in the pile. What we do is we put them on there, and after he got undone, he goes, cabbage? I said, what? He talked again, he said something else, and at the end he went, cabbage? I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. What's this guy doing? What do you mean? He says, he turned around, goes, he turns around, he's a Georgia boy, and he says, uh, well, well, you, uh, Ain't you an, an, an Italian boy? I said, uh, I turned around, I said, uh, well, I'm, I'm Greek. And he goes, I could tell by that nose you got. I said, that's great, man. This guy just insulted me in front of everybody. That's okay. <laughs> he said, I could tell by that nose you, you're Italian or something. Uh, and I'm thinking, he goes, you know, cabbage. I'm, Wait a second, you talking about cabbage? He goes, yeah, yeah, that's it, cabbage. Uh, <laughs> oh boy. The Japanese could not say Lollapalooza. You're right, and that's what they used to use. L's during Lucky uh, Lucky Lucy, uh, during the World War II, uh, they had ones for Germans because they couldn't say it. That's where they come up with these passwords, just so you know, uh, off of the language and stuff. It's not that hard uh, to come up with things. You just, you know, they. But uh, he could not frame it to pronounce it right. See, I'll frame it. They couldn't move their tongue that way. Then they took him and they slew him at the passage of Jordan. And there fell at that time of the Ephraimites 40 and 2,000. That's a lot. Yeah, well, you've got to understand something. Not just because of that. It's more or less because um, we got a, we got a civil war going on right here. And when you have a civil war... It gets dirty. Civil wars are, are really the dirtiest wars you'll ever get into. Um, well, anyway, 42,000. Now, look, it says, And Jephthah judged Israel, uh, how long? Six years. Now, I don't know if you noticed that, but if you go back and you check all of them, he, he, here we have a lot spoken of two chapters for one man, and, and he only reigned for six years. The shortest, he, it's actually been the shortest reign so far. 
but he gets more time in the Bible. Why? More happened. Mm -hmm. God had to deal with him more. So God puts it in the book. He says now, uh, verse number 8, And after him, Ibzan of Bethlehem judged Israel. Now, Ibzan is from, uh, go, go to uh, Joshua, go to back to Joshua 19. The book of Joshua. Just one book back, chapter 19. Now this is a different, this is a Bethlehem of the uh, north. It's not, uh, it's not Bethlehem of, uh, of, of, that you're thinking down in Judah, okay? Uh, he's, he puts it here that within, look, it says, and, and this, uh, the second lot, it, 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 uh, lot came forth to Simeon, even of the tribe of the children of uh, Simeon, according to their families, it was the inheritance uh, within the inheritance of, of the children of uh, Judah. And uh, I, I don't know why I even put that there, but uh, it's actually in verse number uh, 10, okay? is Zebulon, because that's where we'll be going. And Zebulon, look down at verse number 15. Zebulon has and Kata and Nahala and Shimron and Idalah and where? Bethlehem. Bethlehem. This is not the Bethlehem of the south in Judah, near Jerusalem. This is a Bethlehem in the north. Uh, there's two Bethlehems, okay. one in the north, one in the south. That Bethlehem, the house of bread, guess what that one became? Years later, they got another name, and it became Nazareth. Amen. Go back to Judges chapter 12. Now, he says he had 30 sons and 30 daughters. Now, watch. This is, this is important. And he says, whom he sent abroad and took, and took in 30 daughters from abroad for his sons... And he judged Israel seven years. Uh, you know what this guy does? Okay, this guy's no, no, no. This guy isn't stupid. This guy's smart. What he's doing? He's got thirty sons, right? He gets them in when he got his sons in the business. He makes them leaders, and he has thirty daughters. You know what he does? He goes and he picks the sons. That's what it's trying to tell you. He got them from abroad. He went and picked them, and he picked the right ones. He's what he's doing is he's getting loyalty. And he's able to manage with loyalty. You see, I've been noticing some things on here, and that is these kind of things. I, I know a lot of preachers like to preach this where they say, well, this is the thing. This guy uh, it didn't do anything. Imagine you, you, did it, you, you were a leader for seven years, and yet you didn't do anything. Well, did you ever think about this? There was nothing to tell because he, he ran a tight ship. Look what it says. He had 30 sons, and he had 30 daughters, and he got sons, son-in-laws from the daughters. He had 60 people helping him lead, and a staff of 60 that were loyal to him. No wonder nothing happened. Uh, it, it says he judged for seven, judged Israel seven years, then Ibzan died and was buried at Bethlehem. And after him, Elon, a, Zebian, a Zebulonite, uh, judged Israel, and he judged Israel ten years. And Elon, the Zebulite, died and was buried in Ajalon. Do you remember Ajalon? Okay, during uh, Joshua chapter 10, when they were in that battle, uh, do you remember he said, sun stand still? And it stood still for 24 extra hours from that time. Okay, the sun stayed in the sky, and he says, but he says, uh, the moon would stay still in Ajalon. So you had the sun one place and the moon in Ajalon. There's Ajalon right there. We're over near that battle place that took place in Joshua uh, chapter 10. And he says, uh, it, it says here, it says, in the country of Zebulon. So you know where Ajalon is now, don't you? Verse number 11. 
And after him, Elon, the Zebulonite, judged Israel, and he judged Israel 10 years. A Zebulonite died and was buried Ajalon in the country. I just read it twice. And after him, Abdon. Uh, he's the godfather. How do you know? Well, his name is Abdon. Ab means father, and Don is the Don, you know, head of the head of the family. You know, Don Vito uh, Coleon. Don Cole. Yeah, <laughs> I'm only kidding, people. You can, man, what's wrong with you tonight? You can't even get a good joke out of this. Man, I'm gonna have to stop. <laughs> Don Vito. I gotta get I gotta get one of them monkeys that I go like this and they dance and stuff like that. The only problem I have is you'll make them the senator over there in Pennsylvania. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, come on. We just—they just voted in a mentally retarded. Yeah. Guy. Yes, they did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's how sick we got. Stupid. <laughs> the whole I mean, state and we—you know, look—it's you're living in a reality show. This all the all the elections from now on are fixed. Uh, that was my last time. It's theirs now. I'm not. I'm never voting again. Oh, come on. Man. I'm not. I'm done. I'm not saving anything. I'm out of here. Uh, we can't win anymore. You might as well figure that out. Well, yeah. It's over. Uh, anyway, uh, and after him, Elon, the a Zebulonite, judged Israel. I said did that already. And after him, Abnon, the, the son of Hillel. We had a gentleman in here. His name was Hillel. He used to sit right here. Uh, he was from Israel. You remember him, Deanna? Uh, that's what his name, Hilly, they used to call him. Uh, Hillel, uh, hallelujah, praise, you know. And uh, he was a, a Parathonite. And he judged that judged Israel, okay. Now, and he had forty sons and thirty nephews, okay. Wow. He had thirty so, forty sons, and th you have to understand they have multiple wives here. Yeah, I hope so. Okay, no woman's producing that many kids. Yeah. Yeah. You know, maybe I mean, e you know, maybe uh, Eve or something like that yeah. when they were bigger people. I mean, these people can do a lot more. I mean, these people are like Amish. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, so this guy, he has, he has 40 sons, he has 30 nephews, he's building, also, he's building that. You know, Jeff only had one girl that we know of. This guy, these, these guys are multiplying wives and multiplying kids, but here's the thing, he has, it says he had three score and ten asses, so you had 40 sons, 30 nephews, what is he doing? He puts them all in the business. And how do they, when they lead, remember I showed, I told you, what do they lead on? They, they lead on uh, donkeys and stuff and mules, okay? Why? It's, it shows that you're a common person, okay? I got to tell you something. That's what I could never stand about our leaders. They're not common people. A, a leader, if you look at David, when the ark comes into town, what does he do? He goes out there. And and and, and, his, and he goes out there. You know what? And here's where here's where your head has to start. It says that he danced before the Lord naked, and everybody thinks he took off his clothes. He was naked in there, dancing around. No, he dressed down, and got in with the common man, and was ju acting just like them, and was praising God with them, and dancing around with the ark, and having a good time. And he, they passed by his house, and there's his wife looking out. And she sees that, and she gets all mad. She despises him, it says. Uh, Mikal, uh, why? She can't, oh, there you go. You're out there dancing with the common people. Yeah, you're the king of Israel. And that's how she was like. And you know what he said? David's like, you missed the whole thing. You're so worried about your status that you didn't even realize that the Lord just came in to Israel. Yeah, amen. And you're not praising you're not praising God at all. You know what you're praising? Your own position. Yeah. She was pompous. Yeah, in the Bible, there's a lot of pompous guys. Uh, when Absalom takes up charge, you know what he does? He lines up chariots and horses and runs them in like a parade. Dun da da! I'm in charge. I guess they, they don't know that they're in charge. How about uh, David's uh, other son, Adonijah? When Adonijah uh, tries to be the king uh, and usurp authority over Solomon, guess how he came in? With chariots and everything in a pr procession. Boom, 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 boom. And he comes in. But you know, the people went, Solomon's on a donkey. Solomon's on a mule. David's mule. Who's the leader? Well, Solomon must be. Why? Because Jesus came in on how? Mule. Yeah. Donkey. Coming on a donkey. <clears throat> you see? 
Who's the leader? The leader had to come in on the common. The common. Andrew Jackson, common man. Maybe people didn't like him. Maybe he was he was whatever. But here's the thing: when Andrew Jackson came in, he was putting his sick guys up on his horse, and he would walk. So he would walk and hold the horse as he walked in. You know what the difference is? He was down there digging and everything else with everybody else. He wasn't up in his palace trying to be the big man. And that's why Andrew Jackson beat the British at New Orleans. Amen. So he has 40 sons. They, they're on ass cults. They're, they're leaders. They're common men and type leaders. And Abnon, the son of Hillel, the Perithite, he died. He was buried in Pirithon in the land of Ephraim, in the mount of the Amalekites. So if you'll notice, even in the burying, looking at it, because it says in the thing, it says he was the son of Hillel, and it says that he was, he, the Parathonite died. He was buried in Parathon. What's that tell you? He didn't take his leadership role and get buried in a big place. He got buried right where he was, right with the common people also, okay? I pastor this a pastor a church in Governor, a pastor a church down here in Raw Sea. I live in Oxbow. I'm gonna tell you something. When I get if 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 the rapture doesn't happen and I do pass away, I'm guaranteeing I'm gonna be somewhere around here. Why? Because this is where God put me. Amen. And until God says, get out of this area, I'm not leaving anywhere. Amen. So that's what we have. It's a pretty easy chapter, okay? But wasn't it good to clear that up? That's why the Bible is such a great piece, is because you've got these guys who have been making these studies and they're scholars and everything else, and all they had to do, all you have to do is read the book and you can correct them. You know why? Because they're not the authority. And that's the biggest problem. I've been in churches where guys actually said, well, you don't only need this. Well, what did the scholars say? Who cares what they said? What's the Bible say? Right. You see the difference? The Bible was made for the common man. That's why this is in your hands today. For years, it was it was sitting at a, at, at inside of a place, and you you had the leaders reading it, and they barely read it. They had other guys read it, and that was we have to go to them. But what happened was then it came into Christianity. God said, "Hey, I wanted to get out to every man." And what they were doing was holding it back. And God said, okay, they're coming a time, it's coming a time, and bam. Once it was out, 1611, it started getting out to everybody. Uh, guess what? Now everybody wants, now it's out to the common man. What does the common man do? He wants to, like, give it back and not look at it. There's no famine in the land of the word of God. It's a famine of hearing it. Yeah, That's yeah. the problem. It, it's all over the place. All you got to do is get it. But nobody wants to hear it. That's the problem. That's why you're empty tonight. Okay? That's why churches all that they base all their they base their whole church on now is singing. You know why? Because nobody wants to hear the word of God. Right. Preachers are getting up and preaching 15 minute messages. Preachers are getting up and getting their messages off the internet, people. Do you realize what's happening? It's a mess. I actually had a King James preacher say that one time to me. He went on Sermon Central, pulled down an outline, and just preached it. And all I could think of is, I can't. I, I feel so sorry for your congregation. Yeah. You didn't take the time to sit down and actually study this out. Right. I, I, you know, my wife tell you I, I spend hours upon hours studying, and I have to keep going back. You come in my house. Do you know what you see at the table? There's a Bible right there. And the reason why is because it's easily accessible that I have to sit down and read that thing. And thank God, I, thank God that God, God wants us that way. Why? Because imagine your lives. Do you realize that words are that important? You know, words cut to the bone. Words of what of what separated families. Words is what 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 got you in most of your trouble in life. And God says, "What I want you to have fitly good fitly words that are placed in order. It's all for you." He's delivered all this for you. You know what the problem we have is? We're not appreciative a lot to God. Forget me. I could care less. I, you, you can get another guy in here as long as he studies. 
but you're not going to replace what God gave you. And that's the most important thing. People never, never, un never underappreciate the Word of God. But nobody died for those other modern Bibles. Not, you don't see it. But this book right here, man, people have died left and right. There's trails of blood, and, and, and it all leads to one other man, and that was Jesus Christ. Yeah, Jesus Christ. And you can't separate Jesus Christ from his word. That's why it's so important. This is not a game when it comes to his word. And, the, and I told you the reason why is this is what shaped families. This is what shaped lives. This is what brought all the, rev, uh, all the revivals and all the people to Christ. This awakening in our country came because of the Word of God. Yeah. And if it wasn't for the Word of God, and it wasn't for us taking it from Britain when they kicked it out, and we ran with it. The first thing that our Congress did when they became, when we became a country, the first resolution ever written was the resolution of 1792, which stated that we were going to print the Bible, and it was going to, it was going to be, it was called the Atkin Bible, that it was to be printed by the Atkin printers because they didn't want to use King James because they didn't want a kid. We were, remember, we're revolutionaries. Right. We just kicked the king out. Right. And they said that that Bible was to be taught in the schools and read. It was supposed to be read, it, all the, read to people, and the gospel was supposed to be preached. And imagine what happened in this country when they did that. We are today, we were the, we, we've been the greatest country and it is all because of this book. Mm -hmm. And look what's happened because they didn't. Yeah, 120 years, 120 years ago, we a modern Bible was written in this country. It was called the American Satanic Version. And they took that one. And that since then, they've been bringing in Bibles and acting like they, well, let me ask you something. You think God, and when we get the millennium, God teaches, you think he's going to turn around and, and give a verse? Because guess what? You're being taught in the millennium. We're going through this Bible in the millennium. God is going to teach us personally. Okay? And he's going to have guys come out. He's going to be there. This is what you're doing. You're going to learn this Bible in the millennium. You're learning. You've got a kickstart of everything. Because that's what you're going to do in the millennium. You're going to learn this Bible. You're going to help God rule over the people that are going to be born here. That's what he's going to do during the millennium. This is the most important thing, is this book. Cherish it. People say you worship a book. Well, Paul did. Praise thy holy word. Somebody want to call me a bibliographer or whatever they want? Yep. Amen. I believe that God gave us this book from heaven. Amen. Amen? And, and Jesus confirmed it by saying he's the word of God. That's mine down there. How many times did, do you think God had to, had to write a Bible? Once. And now, what do you think, in the millennium, we're going to turn, Jesus gets up there and he says, okay, uh, the wages of sin is death. Hold on a second. What does, what does your Bible say? <laughs> you think there's going to be a discussion on that? What's your Bible say? What's your Bible say? Well, in the Hebrew it says this, and in the Greek it says that. It's not going to be that, that, that saying. You know what the originals are? Thus saith the Lord. And we have the only book, go in any of your modern Bibles, you will not see the words, thus saith the Lord. You have the only Bible that's on the planet that says, thus saith the Lord. That's the originals. God said this. And when Jesus is talking, he said these things. And they recorded them. This is... You, There's codes. There's everything in here. I mean, I bring it out. I, I, I show you guys. 1611 is all over the Bible. I, I'll give you another one. Go to Ephesians chapter 4. We've got two minutes. I, I'm going to show you some things. I love this stuff. <laughs> Do you know why I show you these things? Because I love you. I want to strengthen your, your look at this book. It's one of the hardest things to grasp. And, but once you do, all scripture is given by what? Inspiration. Inspiration. Forget about God breath. That's, a, that's, that's what it means. That's what that word would mean in Greek because it's an incomplete. It's inspire, in spirit, 
God is using spirit. It's my, these words are what? Spirit. Inspiration. They're in spirit and they are truth. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4. And look down. Let's go down to uh, in Ephesians chapter 4. Check this out. Go to starting in verse number 11. Now you'll notice something. Look at the end of verse number 11. Is that a period? Nope. No, it's a semicolon, isn't it? So it continues the sentence, keeps going. Look at verse number 12. It has a colon. It means it doesn't end. Look at verse thir the end of verse 13. Another colon. This is a long sentence, isn't it? Look down at 14. And still the same sentence. 15, still the same sentence. Look at the period right there. At 16 at the very end. Now look. Look what he says. And he gave some apostles and some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and teachers... They're all teachers. What do they do it for? For the perfecting of the saints. For the work of the ministry. For the edifying of the body of Christ. This is what we have for the church. These things. And what is it waiting until we all come in the unity of the faith as one. We are, we're using this to get in. We're bringing these things together to be thinking alike. And he says, and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children. You're not going to be an immature little brat tossed about, tossed to and fro, carried about by, with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in, into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual work in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. That's how you build one. That's how you build a church. Right there. That's how you build people right there. Did you notice anything about that? It started in verse number 11, ended in verse number 16. 1611. When was your book published? And he said, this is what you need to do. I gave you these guys to build you up. And in that word, he said, and this is what does it. What's that? They're going to be preaching this. They preach God's word at that time. That was God's word, whatever they were preaching. Nowadays, this is God's word, and all these things come true just by even numbers. Well, those numbers weren't there in the originals. They're now, are now, and they're very inspired. Why? I've actually done the math. Right. <laughs> There's no way. There is no way a man could have wrote this book. He could not have put all that in there and then wrote the book around it. And it goes further and further. And when we're in the millennium, God's going to open this book up. Because when we got to heaven in chapter 4 of Revelation, after we get through the judgment seat of Christ, and we get in there, and then we get ready to come back, did you ever notice that, that, that it took Christ to get up to the podium and do what? Open up the book, because no man could open it. Yeah. It says. Right. He couldn't even understand it. Well, we're understanding pretty good, you say. Hey, that guy, he knows pretty well up there, you think to yourself. You know what? I don't know nothing compared to this book. Maybe about what, 2 3%? Do you realize what he's going to do? He's going to open your mind up. You're going to have an IQ of like 1,000. It's just going to start coming. All you that can't pay, that have problems paying attention, you won't have nothing like that. And then he's going to put codes out and everything else and show you. He's going to, I'm, I'm going to tell you what this book is. This book is the book of life. It produces life. You're waiting for names. Oh, he opened up the book and then he opened up other books. Yeah, you got a book of books. All the names are in here, people. Your name's in here. And I'm not talking about whosoever. Your name's somewhere in here and God's going to look in the book. Is his name there? And your name's going to be in this book. It's going to be here. Mm -hmm. There's a book of the living and there's a book of the, there's a book of living and there's a book, Lamb's Book of Life. You know what they are? The book of the living is in Deuteronomy it's, it, I mean, it's in the Old Testament because that kills everybody. That's the book of the living under heaven. And then the book of life is going to be the New Testament and everybody's name's going to be in there that got saved. Amen. And you'll notice one thing. The Old Testament is that much bigger 
than the, than the New Testament. That's going to be the ratio of people saved to lost. This book is awesome. <laughs> That's why it's always at my house and it's always open. So my wife and I, we can go over to that book and we can pick it up and we can read this thing. And, and it's always accessible in our house. This is a beautiful book. Amen? Man, that was good, wasn't it? Amen. Let's pray, Father. We thank thee. Thank you, Lord, for this book. And thank you, Lord, for teaching us. And thank you, Lord, for just, Lord, for, for taking so much time with us, Lord. Father, uh, we don't even acknowledge, we don't even realize, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son. We just don't fathom it and how great that is. He gave some. Loved, what he loved the most, he gave. Father, thank you for this, everything you've given us. And thank you, Lord. I could care less who's in charge of this world. I want the man who's in charge of everything, who owns the earth. We're just messing it all up in our world. But thank you, Lord, for being so kind and generous to us. Can't wait to meet you someday. Thank you, Lord. I want to meet you personally. I'm a little afraid but and fearing of you, but I'm going to meet you. Thank you for all you do, Lord, and all you've done. You've been gracious and beautiful to us. Love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Hi, Marilyn. Hi, Maggie.